Hello, so these are the questions. Um, the first question I have is from Catherine Tameo. Sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong. Her questions are, um, what growing pesticides do you use? How do you deal with your pests, insects and diseases? And what sprays and pesticides do you use? So on this farm here, we use an agronomist, basically a crop doctor, okay? They have a qualification in agriculture, but then they will also top that up with a professional qualification that specialises in sprays. Um, each spray is specific to crops, diseases, pests and weeds. They will walk through the crop at various times of the year um, looking for any issues and they will recommend sprays, but only if they are really required. Problems might be the weather if it's a wet year we'll get more pests and diseases um, or if it's a really dry summer as well the farmer will not spray unless he absolutely has to um, the more spray that he uses the less pro profitable the, the crop is going to be at the end of the day some crops are planted in the autumn and not harvested till the following august september um, so there's a lot of time and money invested in the crop that's in the ground um, and he doesn't actually know at this point what he's going to sell that crop for, as in how much money per tonne he's going to get for it. Um, so the buyer of the crop sets the price. Um, it's most important to remember that every step of the use of sprays is licensed. So um, they've all been approved and licensed by the government. So each spray will have a license and it will be licensed for a specific crop. So some sprays will be licensed for potatoes, some sprays will be licensed for wheat, some will be licensed for oats or oilseed rape. Um, so the spray has to be licensed, but also the operator has to be licensed as well. So the farmer or the contractor will have to have sat um, exams to be able to be licensed to buy, store and use the sprays so that we know as consumers that he is legally allowed to use those sprays for the specific crop or the specific problem. Okay. The other question Catherine asked was, what variety of crops do you grow? Here on my husband's farm, we grow mainly spring barley um, and that is planted in the springtime and harvested in the autumn. We grow varieties that we hope will be sold as malting barley um, to be used in whiskey and beer production. Um, but we also grow some winter wheat as well. Um, and that was sown in the autumn of 2020 and will be harvested in August, September 2021. Um, and that will be used for animal feed. Um, and it'll be sold to a feed mill like Harborough or Norvite. Um, where the animal nutritionists will turn that into animal feed for us. Um, but over the whole of Scotland, we grow lots of different crops, including grass, that's one of the most important crops, oilseed rape, that's the yellow flowers that you'll see in May, oats, along with wheat and barley, um, that I've already mentioned. We grow potatoes, carrots, turnips, parsnips, beetroot, broccoli, cauliflower peas, strawberries, raspberries, soft fruits, um, and apples as well. Um, science and research play a huge role in crop protection and how we can make our crops more efficient with minimal damage to the environment. So there's a lot of science goes into all the crops that we actually grow. Um, I come on later on to speak a little bit about strawberries. So um, we'll go in and speak about that a little bit later. Um, and I think this is another question from Catherine. How and what do you feed your animals? So we have beef and sheep on our farm and during the summer that beef and sheep will eat grass. So the areas that we can't plough um, will grow grass, which is still a crop. Um, this is the land that we cannot plough because the soil isn't deep enough or good enough to plough. Actually, 80% of Scotland can't be ploughed. Um, so growing grass in Scotland is a really huge thing. We're very lucky that we can. Um, in the winter, our cattle will come into the shed um, and they'll be fed preserved grass, which is basically silage and which has been cut in the summer. Um, and once you remove the air from it, it kind of pickles it. 
Um, so it'll either be put into a silage pit or it'll be wrapped tightly in the black bags that you might see, black round bags sitting um, in the farmyards for the winter. So we'll store grass basically. We'll also maybe make some hay if the weather's really nice um, and that can be fed to the sheep because the sheep love hay and that's basically dried gra grass. It's dried using the sunshine and the wind in the summer. Okay. The sheep will stay out all year. Sheep don't really do inside. The only time that we would really bring them inside is for lambing. And that's basically so that we can look after them properly and we can give them the correct husbandry. If you've got a lot of sheep, sometimes it's easier to have them in a shed where they're handy and you can assist if there's any issues. Um, both cattle and sheep will be fed concentrates and they will be made up of... Um, feed that we sell to the feed mills they will make it up into concentrates but different concentrates will be for different kinds of animals so you'll have sheep concentrate you'll have beef concentrate you'll have suckler cow concentrate and there's different vitamins and minerals depending on what you want the, the animals to do um, and also if you're milking as well um, they need a really high concentrate diet for, for producing milk. Um, Daniel Mount has asked a question what is the hardest part of keeping animals? Well, it's usually when you lose an animal that you really like. So if you've got your favourite cow that you might have had, you've maybe had her mother and her mother and her grandmother on the farm and she's just a really good cow um, or a favourite sheep that you have that's a bit of a character, um, losing them is probably the hardest thing. Um, if you phoned the vet and they've come out and they've looked at it and you know advised you to give them some medicine and it hasn't worked that's that's hard it's hard when you lose them it's also a huge responsibility as well having livestock because you basically have to check them every single day so seven days a week 365 days a year the farmer will be out there checking his livestock and making sure that they're they're all okay and that they're not needing help it's quite easy to tell if somebody's not well. Um, you can usually tell they're maybe away in a corner, they're not looking well, they've got the head down, their ears will be back. Um, but the farmer needs to check every day that his, that his livestock's okay. Right. Uh, Leo Smith has put in a question. What laws do you need to follow to look after animals on farms? Farmers have lots of rules and regulations and legislation as well to look after their animals. Um, they have to look after there's so there's legislation called the Animal Health and Well Welfare of Scotland Act 2006. So they have to adhere to that. There's also the Animal and Well Wildlife Penalties Protection and Powers. That's 2019. Um, there's also guidance on different species. So different species um, need you know different different ways of looking after them. You know. Um, there's also legislation regarding um, waste, so the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency have got legislation. Um, and there's lots of rules and regulations controlling agriculture and food production because if you think of farming as food production, it quite rightly should be legislated and it should be that farmers actually have to adhere to these rules and regulations okay um when you so taylor cameron has put in a question when you have sheep or cows do they like it when you pet them <laughs> that's a great question you know this yes they do if you've got a quiet cow who you've maybe been born on the farm and she's a bit of a character and she's maybe been inside for a while they love it when you scratch them but it's, it really isn't safe for people that don't know the animals to go into a field with them and try and pet them or chase them. Um, sheep are the same. Um, on my mum's farm, we had some sheep that would come and take nuts right out of your hand. And they loved it when, they, when you scratched them in behind their ears. So, yeah, um, they absolutely do. It, you know, it's just like your dog, really. They love it when you pet them. And um, if you become friendly enough with an animal, yeah, absolutely, they love it. Okay. Um, Anna Malaka, sorry if you're, that's not quite your name. Um, how much do farmers get paid from the stores? I assume you mean supermarkets um, that sell their products. Well, the, 
it's actually, on average, it's a very small percentage. It would probably be somewhere between 10 and 20%. Um, it depends on the product that you're looking at. Um, bread might be a very small percentage, even though there's quite a lot of flour in bread. Um, whiskey and beer, again, a, a very small percentage. Um, but without the barley, there is no whiskey and beer. Um, milk is a very easy one to look at because there's the price of milk, the price that farmers are set for milk is usually set for a couple of months. So in November, it was going between 29 and 30 pence a litre. But if you look at that in a shop, it's about 70 pence a litre, depending where you buy it, up to 90 pence a litre. Um, so that's about a half to a third. Um, but m supermarkets don't actually make any money on milk. They What they call it is a lost leader. So it is basically on the shelves to get you into the supermarket to buy your milk. And when you're in buying your milk, you're going to buy other things as well. OK, so it really depends. Um, if you think about beef or lamb, it's a uh, it's a bit harder to quantify that. Um, the price fluctuates a lot more. Um, so if you're selling a store lamb, which is straight off the hill at about six months old, um, not finished for market yet, um, the farmer might get anywhere between 30 and 50 pound for that lamb. The guy that buys it and then finishes it ready for market, he might make, he might sell it for about 80 pound, 90 pound. But if you think he's had to pay somewhere between 30 and 50 pound for that lamb in the first place, his margins are quite tight. But by the time that lamb gets to a butcher's, um, the butcher might be able to sell it for about £200. Um, but then he's had to buy it from the processors and, and the slaughterhouse where the lambs come from. So there's a lot of processes in food production, you know, and uh, there's lots of lo different pieces of the jigsaw. So a lot of farmers, what they will do is try and cut out all the middlemen and they'll have a farm shop. So if they've got a farm shop, they're selling direct to the public. That means they're getting everything that's in between the store price and the the finished price that they're being able to sell it over the counter. Okay. Uh, the next questions, there's quite a lot of the same question. So it was Amy Woolett, what qualifications do you have to get to be a farmer and how many? Finley Monroe and Holly Wishart have said, what qualifications do you need to be a farmer? Can you train as a farmer? Do you need to go to university to be a farmer? What qualifications do you need to be a successful farmer? What subjects should I study at school if I want to get into farming? Do I just go to college or university to be a farmer or do I do an apprenticeship? Well, the, there's a lot of questions in there, but basically um, you can do an apprenticeship. Absolutely. Um, you can go in and, and look for apprenticeships with Lantra. Um, you can study agriculture in various different ways. So you can do an apprenticeship with Lantra or you could go to college or university to study the likes of straight agriculture or something like rural business management, which includes um, farm businesses. Um, farmers nowadays really do need a wide range of qualifications. Um, they run businesses that are dependent on so many factors weather, global markets, high spec machinery worth thousands and thousands of pounds. They have to deal with staff, they have to deal with um, livestock husbandry, livestock issues, regulations, markets, as in, you know, where they're going to sell their fin fin finished product. Um, but there are lots of different jobs in food production. It's not just about studying to go and be a farmer. Um, studying agriculture, or rural business management um, can open doors to a brilliant career in the rural sector. And some of the jobs I've already mentioned, some of the jobs I have done, um, there's just so many different jobs within agriculture. And we'll speak a little bit more about it as I go on. Um, somebody else has asked, what Nat Fives and hires do I need? Well, I would say, a wide range, as wide as you can, okay? Um, most subjects can be translated into agriculture, but the key ones I would have said are geography, because in agriculture, you're dealing with the soil, 
you're dealing with the ground, the topography of the landscape, um, maths, English, biology, chemistry and business. But honestly, any subjects that you're going to sit at school will help you take a step into the likes of agriculture or the rural economy. You know, um, home economics as well, because it's food, it's the end product. Chefs are really interested in what is going on in farms. They love it when they can get a farm to supply them direct and they can put that on their menu. So home economics as well. So um, the best thing I would say to do is just to work hard at school and try and get as many qualifications as you can. But by no means is college or university the be all and end all. There is absolutely other ways into this, into the rural economy, okay? Um, somebody else has asked, do I need Nat 5 maths and English? Now, they're not essential. You know, like I've said, there's so many ways of getting into the, into working in agriculture and food production. Um, but, you know, just work as hard as you can in school and try and get as many as you can. Not five, five maths. I, I am not a mathematician and I couldn't do maths in school to save myself. It took me till sixth year to get my O grade, okay? So, um, maths, it, it would be great to have it, but it isn't essential, okay? So please don't give up if you don't, if you don't get it, but just try and work as hard as you can, okay? So this is a totally different question now from Macy Ellie Stewart, who has asked how many strawberries are stro how strawberries are produced in a year? Well, in Scotland, we are renowned for producing strawberries, okay? And in 2018, which was the most up-to-date figure I could get, Scotland produced 25,000 tonnes of strawberries, okay? We have the very best growing conditions for strawberries in Scotland. Um, we have got cool summers with long daylight hours and that converts the starches into sugars, okay? And makes our strawberries really lovely and sweet, okay? Um, most nowadays are grown in polytunnels and that is basically to just try and protect the crop in a wet year. Um, the farmer does not want to lose the crop if it rains too much. Um, in 1990, so that's 30 years ago, yeah, 30 years ago, um, Scotland was producing about two and a half thousand tonnes of strawberries. And it was basically six weeks, but thanks to science and research um, and the polytunnels, now we can be picking strawberries for about half the year. So we'll start picking in late April and we can still be picking at the end of September into October. So we have extended the growing season and a lot of that is to do with research and the scientists that are working on, on new varieties of strawberries as well. Okay, um, I've got some other figures here for you. In Scotland, we also grow um, 2,900 tonnes of raspberries. This is a big one because we've got great soil for growing carrots. 231,000 tonnes of carrots. Now carrots like nice sandy soil, so you'll grow a lot of them up in Murray. Um, uh, 64,000 tonnes of turnips. 34,000 tonnes of peas. A lot of peas are grown in Angus. Um, 14,000 tonnes of Brussels sprouts, we had for Christmas. And the big one in Scotland is 1.03 million tonnes of potatoes. Scotland is excellent at growing potatoes and it's because we've got the right soil and the right conditions. Okay. Um, Harrison Wilson has asked, what is the average salary of a farmer? <laughs> well, it depends how profitable the business is. Um, but the farmer still needs to be able to pay himself a wage um, and provide for his family. Um, it is probably in the region of a thousand pound a month. Um, some will be less, some will be more. It just depends. Um, it isn't a lot for the hours that they put in and the responsibility they have. Um, they will probably pay any other staff more 
um, to get the staff to come and to get them to stay. Um, <clears throat> farming subsidies were introduced um, after the war, um, basically because agriculture is what we call a primary industry. So farmers don't have anybody to pass their costs on to. The way the markets work, um, they basically have to take what they get um, for their produce. Um, they are, the subsidies are not so much to support farming. They're not, I wouldn't call them farming subsidies, but I would call them as food production subsidies. So they also help keep the cost of food on our supermarket shelves down. So relatively speaking, we actually have quite a low cost of food in this country, and that's because of subsidies. Okay. Um, Holly Wishart has asked, um, when animals travel to different countries, do they have to go through security like we do? Um, <laughs> yes, actually they do, but it's not so much security um, the way that we would do through with a beeper, um, but they do need an export health certificate um, and to be correctly identified with ear tags, just like um, the earrings. And since we left the European Union, this has all changed and they need extra ear tags um, to say that they've come from the UK now. Um, they've also got to be inspected by a vet um, to make sure that the paperwork matches um, the animal. And they also will have had to have health screening as well. So they'll have had to have a blood test. They'll have to be clear for certain um, diseases as well. So yes, it is kind of like security, but um, a bit different. Okay. That's a good question, Holly. Um, the main, oh, I, sorry. The main types of animals that we would want to export live um, are actually the high value animals for breeding. So our pedigree animals. Um, we wouldn't necessarily export live animals for slaughter anymore. Um, we haven't done that for a long time because um, it's actually cheaper to export the carcass than it is the live animal. So, um, but since we left the European Union, we can't now export live animals to Northern Ireland without them going through the health certificates and being inspected by a vet. So Northern Ireland now is slightly different to, to the rest of the UK. Um, somebody else, I think this is maybe Holly again, do you have to get a qualification to be a farmer? Um, legally, no, you don't. You don't have to get a qualification. Um, but if you want to then go on and spray your crops, you need to get a professional qualification. You need to go and sit your spraying exams to be able to buy and store and, and use the sprays. Um, you would need to then go and sit an exam to be able to haul your livestock in to more than uh, about 40 miles. You would need to be able to go and sit an exam to be able to um, take them in the, the livestock trailer um, if your mart is further than 40 miles. Okay, so you don't have to have a qualification, but if there's things that you want to then do as a farmer, you would have to then go and sit a, a professional qualification. Okay. Caitlin White has asked, um, are there different types of soil they use? Um, yes. So Scotland is made up of lots and lots of different types of soil. Geography is very important part of agriculture um, and food production. Um, Murray has some fa fantastic soils for growing vegetables um, and cereals. So down at the coast, um, this really sandy soil that you'll get down there is really good for growing carrots. Whereas if you think, if you came inland and headed up towards Granton and Spey, you're not going to be able to plough much of the land there. So that's only really good for growing grass and heather, a different kind of crop. But so there's different kinds of soil. So if you think down the east coast of Scotland, um, right down the east coast of Scotland, there's a thin band of very good quality soil. And that's where we would grow the majority of our crops, vegetables, soft fruits, um, and, and vegetables okay so yeah different and even within a farm so within our farm here we've got different types of soil um from the high ground to the low ground so we run right down to the dawn 
Um, so down at the dawn, the, the ground is sandier and it drains away, whereas up at the top of the farm, we've got some clay parts that you really wouldn't want to plough because um, there's not the depth of soil there. OK, um, and that kind of answers the next question as well. What different types of farming are there? Well, this depends on the soil and it depends on the location. Um, Scotland has lots of different farming from the hills or way up in the Cairngorms or the Highlands, um, right down to the East Coast, um, where we grow lots of different crops and vegetables, right over to the Southwest, where we have a lot of dairy farms because they have high rainfall and are really good at growing grass. Um, <clears throat> other types of land use, um, things like Christmas trees. So Christmas trees might be grown in somewhere that can't be ploughed. Um, they'll just open up the soil and plant the Christmas trees. So uh, a lot of forestry in areas where we can't actually grow crops. Um, OK, there's also things like renewable energy with wind turbines and things like that. OK, so lots of different types of farms right the way across Scotland. But if I was so if I was a farmer and I wanted to go and buy a farm, it would depend what kind of farming I wanted to do as to where I could buy the farm, really. You know, um, for profitability, I wouldn't then go and buy a, a big arable farm down in, in uh, the likes of Angus or in Murray because that would cost me a lot more. I would be looking for a livestock farm. And the reason that there's livestock there is because we can't plough the ground and what we can grow is grass and we can't grow lots of cereals or vegetables. Um, OK. Caden Conley. What do the colours on the sheep mean? Um, depends on the time of year. The colours in the sheep at the moment um, on their sort of bottoms show where the where they've been served by the ram. OK, so um, it's when the ewe was served. So the rams will go out and they'll have a rattle on them with a colour on them. Um, the ewes have got about a 17 day cycle and they'll change the colour of the, the waxy crane so that they know which yows are going to be lambing early and which yows are going to be lambing a wee bit later, OK? So that the shepherd can look after the sheep properly, OK? Um, the, this time of year, the, lamb, the, yows, the female sheep, the yows, will be getting scanned. Um, and that's just like a scanner that you would use to see a baby inside a, a mum's tummy, OK? And that will tell the farmer how many lambs are in it. So that's a guy that's a professionally trained. He's um, got, ex he's had years and years of experience of scanning sheep. And he can tell whether there's maybe one, two, three, um, or sometimes even four lambs in the female sheep, or there's maybe nothing. And the farmer will put a dot on the back of the sheep to say whether it's a single, a twin, or a triplet. And then he can split the sheep out and the female sheep out and feed them according to what they're carrying. OK, um, so that's the colours on at the moment. But during lambing time, if they've got numbers on them, so that might be um, he'll spray a number on a on a female sheep, a ewe that has had maybe a pair of twins. So he'll mark them with, say, a number 10. OK, and then he'll mark the lambs with a number 10 as well. And that's so that when he turns them out into the field, if they do get mismothered or they get lost, he can match them up again. It's just for husbandry. It's so that he can look after his, his livestock and look after and make sure as many lambs as possible survive and, and they, that, that they live. OK, so Molly Walker has asked a question. What is the easiest part of owning a farm? Well, um. <laughs> There's nothing easy about owning a farm um, for lots of reasons. Uh, it's hard work with long hours uh, and very little financial reward. And it's a really stressful job. But you might say, well, why on earth do you do it? Because we love it. We're passionate about it. We believe in what we're doing. Um, there's lots and lots of great things about being a farmer. Um, you're basically pretty much your own boss, you know. So um, being passionate about what you do and loving the place that you're farming, lo loving the livestock, seeing the, the sun coming out and seeing the crops starting to grow, <coughs> excuse me, makes it all worthwhile. But I wouldn't say it's easy. 
it's it's very hard work, but there is lots and lots of rewards. Um, Alexander Pearson asks, how many animals will a farmer look after in his or her employment as a farmer? Well, this is a great question, but it's really hard to answer. It depends on the type of farm and it depends on the size of it as well. So <clears throat> um, it depends as to whether there's livestock on it for a start. Farms with suckler cows, um, that's a female that will have a calf every year, um, or breeding ewes, um, females that will have lambs every year, will sell most of their stock but keep the best females as replacements. Um, if we take a livestock farm with maybe 500 ewes, you would hope to get anywhere between 750 and 1,000 lambs every spring. And maybe if you've got one... 150 cows you would hope to get 140 calves a year so if you say the farmer has worked for 40 years that's a uh, 500 ewes times 40 it's eight say 850 lambs times 40 and it's 150 cows times 40 and it's um 140 calves times 40 but actually equals 65,000 over 65,000 animals in his lifetime but if you look at maybe a piggery or chickens, they'll have thousands and thousands of, of animals every year. OK, so it really depends. It could be a wee farm with two cows and 10 sheep or it could be a big farm. So it really depends. But I've sort of gone for an average, an average livestock farm. So you're over 65,000 animals um, in his lifetime. OK. Um, how do you start your own farm? This is a, as well, this is from Alexander. Well, that's a $65 million question, isn't it? Firstly, you've got to be interested. You know, um, you've also got to be passionate. You've got to be committed. Helping out at a farm at the weekends is a good start. Finding out what you're interested in, um, whether it's livestock, tractors, crops, uh, machinery. Try and gain as much experience and knowledge as you can you know maybe working at the weekends on a farm when you're still in school look at college university apprenticeships um, and never let anyone tell you that it is impossible um, because nothing is impossible if you are determined enough okay um, another question here is how do you become a farmer it's not easy to become a farmer um, because Unless you're born into it and you become a partner in your, your family farm, the biggest cost is the land, whether you can rent it or whether you can buy it. Um, but it is possible to work on a farm or work in the rural economy like I've done um, without actually having to own a farm. Um, working by working hard at school, studying a subject that you love. Um, and applying yourself, it is possible to become a farmer. Um, there's lots of different careers and lots of different paths that you can use to get into farming and, uh, and, and to actually become a farmer. So don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it, but I won't sit here and tell you it'll be easy because it, you know, it won't. That's why I think right at the beginning I said you need to be determined, okay? Um, what other jobs can come from working closely with a farm? Well, there is absolutely hundreds of jobs that you can get um, that work around about the farm, okay? From your vet and all the people that work at the local vet's practice, there's animal nutrition, sales rep, feed mill managers, agronomist, that's a crop doctor, scientists, agricultural consultants, farm secretaries, accountants, lawyers, animal behaviorists you need people crop scientists i've let mentioned scientists but you actually need crop scientists and animal scientists animal breeding specialists like i did scottish government inspectors um there's schemes that farmers can join to help sell their produce so there's um scottish quality cereals um where you would go out and inspect the farm and make sure that they're doing everything correct um, there's also um, QMS, which is Quality Meat Scotland, and they again have inspectors that go out and make sure um, that the farmers are doing everything. There is, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, 
animal, plant and health staff, people that go and inspect potatoes to make sure that they're quality to go to, for seed. Scotland sell a lot of seed potatoes. Um, National Farmers Union staff, they're the people that represent farmers for government. Grain merchants and storage facilities for the grain. Procurement, so your people that go and buy your beef and your lamb. Soil scientists, engineers, mechanics, people that sell the tractors, people that repair tractors if you've got an engineering brain. Shed designers, because obviously farmers all have sheds, they always need new sheds put up. They have handling facilities for their livestock within those sheds, people to design them, people to sell them. Uh, sheep shearers that come around and do the sheep shearing, scanners that will come and scan. They have people that will come and trim the feet of your cattle. They've got AI, um, AI technicians for, for cattle, um, seed merchants. Then you've got all your sales reps, machinery, seed, spray, fertilizer, seed re uh, sales reps. And then you've got your designers as well, people that design all the things that farmers need, you know, computer packages, everything, you know, the, these self-drive tractors that they have now, they basically set them going on this computer. So computer programmers are a huge part of agriculture now. Um, agriculture is actually one of the oldest STEM industries. Okay. Um, Here's a question now. How many hours do farmers work? Well, <laughs> it's a really good question. Usually as long as there is daylight. And even then there's lights in the shed. But it depends on the farm. So a dairy farm will start milking at maybe five o'clock in the morning um, with a morning milking and then an afternoon milking about three o'clock. Generally, farmers will work anything from about half past seven in the morning until about four at the night. But they might come in and then do the paperwork. You know, there's a lot of paperwork and recording and registering that has to go on on a farm now. Um, during the busy times, laving, lambing and calving <clears throat> or harvest, they really will work all the hours that there are just to get the job done. Um, on some farms, they will they'll be working 18, 19, 20 hours a day. Um, they won't stop. If the harvest is going and the combine harvester can go and the damp doesn't come down, they will keep going all night. Um, on a big livestock farm where they're maybe lambing inside in a shed, they might employ people to come in and be a lammer. So I've done that. I've worked on a big farm where we've had, we had a thousand lamb yows in the shed to lamb. And there was two of us there during the day and we did 12 hour shifts. And then a night lammer came in at night and he did a 12 hour shift as well. Um, and the shepherd spent the day basically taking yows and lambs out of the shed and away onto the grass and looking after all the other sheep he had to look after. Um, <clears throat> what is the daily routine of a farmer and how long do you normally work a day? Well, again, it's, you know, it depends on the type of farm. It depends on the time of year. On a livestock farm, the first job is always to check all your animals, make sure they're all OK um, and not needing your help. And then in the winter, um, you would feed them to make sure they're all fed. Um, you might need to muck out the shed to get rid of the dung that's underneath them. Um, that's a really important part because that will then get spread back on the fields and produ produce nitrogen and help the grass grow. Um, <clears throat> give the animals fresh bedding. So it really just depends. Um, in the springtime, you would be lambing or calving or you might be away ploughing. Um, getting the fields ready for sowing. You would then, as soon as you finish ploughing, you would start sowing. So every day is different. It's just hard to tell. You know, um, on an arable farm, you would be, like I've said, ploughing, sowing, spraying um, or harvesting. On a dairy, you would be milking twice a day, 365 days a year. So it never stops. You know, farming, it just... We always think of November is the time when the new farming year starts. Um, and uh, it just, it's a continuous cycle. It never stops. Farmers never stop working. They never not stop thinking about what they need to do tomorrow and the next day and next week. Um, so every day is different. Okay. Um, and that obviously goes along with all the other jobs you need to fit in between fencing repairs maybe you might need to do some welding you might need to fix your tractor or a, or a 
green cart that's got a hole in it, which is a bit of a disaster. Um, ordering, paying bills, selling, um, paying your staff, doing your paperwork. So it's, you know, there's ev every day is different. <laughs> and there's, there's always something to be done. Um, is there any weather that affects farmers in summer? Yes, absolutely. So too much of any kind of weather um, is a problem at any time of year. So in a summer, if we get a really hot, dry summer, drought, um, well, the crop will still grow, but it won't be as good as it, as it could have been. And also the straw will be a lot shorter. So there'll be a shortage of straw, so that the price of straw will go, will go up. Um, <clears throat> it will also mean that what crop you do get, the price, the price might be better per tonne, but you might not get as many tonnes. Does that make sense? Um, but just like in the summer we can get too much rain, so flooding can cause a problem. Flooding can wash away the topsoil, wash away your crop. Um, it can mean that the, the fields are too wet to get heavy machinery onto. So you maybe have a field of oats that you were going to harvest, but actually you can't get on to harvest it because the, the ground's too wet because it's it's just rained and rained and rained for six weeks. Um, but it's just like when we get too much snow, you know, um, the farmer has to, to go out and clear the roads. Um, so climate change is a huge part of, of agriculture and uh, there's scientists looking at it now and as to how we can continue to produce food but actually reduce our emissions. Um, but agriculture actually only produces about 10% of the emissions in the UK. Transport is up about 26%. So agriculture itself is quite low, but we, we absolutely need to be lower, you know, and scientists are looking at that right now, okay? Um, that's another great career for somebody if you wanted to go in and have a look at how we can reduce our carbon footprint, okay? Um, how much money does a farmer make in a year? Well, that's a, <laughs> another good question. Um, but if it wasn't for the subsidy system and the fact that our food is subsidised, most farmers wouldn't make any money at all. Okay. Um, so the salary that he pays himself depends on how profitable the farm is, if it's profitable at all. Um, it just, it really depends. Okay, but I think I said earlier on, on average, it would be about a thousand pound a month. It might be more, it might be less. It just, you know, okay. Um, do farmers ever get holidays? And if they do, who looks after the farm and the animals when the farmer is away? <laughs> if the farmer is lucky enough, yes. Again, it depends on the size of the farm. If it's a small farm, they might just get a neighbor to check over the stock. They would go away at a time of year when things are quiet. So on a livestock farm, you wouldn't be lambing, you wouldn't be calving, you wouldn't be shearing the sheep. You would have got your silage or your hay done and then you might go away on holiday after all the jobs are done. Okay, um, on a bigger farm, you might have staff that would look after the place for you. Um, and hopefully everything would be okay while you're away. But they really don't take very many holidays, maybe two years, two weeks a year. Um, they might take a week in the summer and they might go away for a week in the winter, but they really don't take a lot of holidays. Um, can you retire? Does farming count as a private business or even if the farmer has a long term partner? Yes, farmers can retire. Um, they can, if it's big, if the farm is big enough, they could bring a son or a daughter into the partnership and they would then take on the farm and eventually the farmer would re re would retire out of it. Um, if there's no family members, the farmer might look for somebody to go into a con what we call a contract farming agreement with and that would mean that the contractor would basically do all the work on the farm so they might um, sow all the crops um, and then there would be a share of the profit at the end. Okay, so there's ways of farmers retiring um, out, out of the farm. Um, <clears throat> what else does farmers do except drive tractors? <laughs> I hope I've answered this question. Um, farmers do a lot, lot more than just drive tractors. I think, I really hope I've answered that. Um, but please, 
if you ha if you think I haven't, come back to me, okay? Farmers do so much more than just drive tractors, but there's nothing better than driving a huge big tractor. <laughs> They're great fun and uh, um, but absolutely essential to the farm being able to to actually produce food for us, okay? Um, who organises what has to be done on a farm and who does all the paperwork? The farmer will decide every day what needs to be done and it will depend a lot on the time of year, okay? The weather, what time of type of farm it is, where they are. Um, again, it depends on how big the farm is. So if it was a dairy farm, the dairyman or the farmer would know that every day he has to milk the cows, you know, every day, twice a day. Um, if he doesn't go and milk the cows, the cows are bawling at the gate to get in to the milking parlour, okay? So it just really, really depends, okay? Um, who does all the paperwork? Well, some farms, again, it depends on how big the farm is. Some farms, if it's a big farm, they might pay a farm secretary to come and do the books for them. They might contract it out. The Agricultural College has, a, within their consultancy, have um, a farm secretaries who will do that for you and produce the farm books for you, uh, register your calves and do your movements and fill in all the paperwork for you. Um, a lot of farms, the farmer will do it himself. So he'll come in at night and he'll have his tea and then he'll go and do the farm, the books, you know, he'll do the VAT and he'll fill out, pay the invoices and pay the bills. Some of them are very, very lucky their, their wife or daughter might do it for them or their son. You know, because the paperwork is such an important part of the of the business. It is a business and every business has to do paperwork, unfortunately. <laughs> OK. Um, do I need to know a lot about plants, animals and fertilizers? Do I need chemistry and biology? <sighs> well, you don't need these qualifications from school, but it would be better to have them, okay? Um, it would be useful to study them at school. Um, and if you then went on to study agriculture or a science, as animal science or soil science, you would then go into them in, in a lot more de in depth, okay? So I would say it would be great if you have them, but don't worry if you don't, okay? But just work hard at school, try your very best, and I really hope that I have answered some of these questions for you. Okay? Thank you, boys and girls. Bye.